This episode of Pick Up the Six podcast is sponsored by Allbirds. I've been an Allbirds customer for years because their shoes look great, they're super comfortable, and they make shoes and clothes that are better for you and better for the planet by using revolutionary premium natural materials. As a runner, I'm also looking for a shoe that feels and fits great out on a run. And so I'm pumped to tell you about the Allbirds Tree Flyer. I have a pair and they are great. The Tree Flyer is lightweight, super springy and wildly comfortable making your running efforts of all shapes and sizes feel surprisingly effortless. They provide unbelievable cushion and comfort. So even your toughest runs are easier on your body. I noticed from step one, when I put these on, they just felt great. And that's thanks to the swift foam midsole. It's lightweight and big on cushion and energy return. I recommend these shoes because I wear these shoes. I have the orange ones. Plus, they have loads of other great stuff, too. And they're hooking you up with a free pair of Allbirds socks on your next order of 50 bucks or more. Just use the promo code PICKUPTHESOCKS. Pretty good, right? Pick up the socks at allbirds.com on your next order of 50 or more, and you're getting a free pair of socks from those guys. Lace up the tree flyer and get running today at allbirds.com. That's allbirds.com. Leadership is a people business. That's the message from John Rennie, a former U.S. Navy nuclear submarine officer who is now a president, CEO, and author. We talk about life down in that metal tube under the water and how those experiences equipped him for life as a civilian leader, plus the real scoop on what chow on a submarine for 100 days in a row is really like. This is a great conversation with a strong leader, and I hope you enjoy it. Hey guys, Brian Jodis back once again off the top. Uh, again, just a huge thanks to our friends at Allbirds for putting some support behind this show. A little wind in the sails of this pirate ship that is Pick Up the Six Productions. And the guy that joins me today, uh, John Rennie, knows a thing or two about ships, boats of all shapes and sizes. He spent some time under the water as a naval nuclear submarine officer. So John, first and foremost, man, good to have you. Welcome and happy new year. Hey, happy new year. It's great to be here. What's the what's the shelf life on Happy New Year? Do we get the month? Do we get the first? So we two were weeks? gonna, you know, yeah. The one thing is, is we can't be June. You can't be in June. <laughs> we we were, we were talking about that to another guy right. the other day. He said, if you see somebody you haven't seen, you know, this year, you got to say Happy New Year. Okay, but cool. I, All right. it, so then we're in good. June. It's it's no, you're done. It's <laughs> like uh, Merry Christmas at uh, you know Halloween. I'm like, bro, right? You're I done. love Christmas. Don't get me wrong, I love it. Yeah. Right, top all time great holiday. Let me. Let me get there. Let me get yeah, the Thanksgiving exactly. and then start throwing the Christmas on. Exactly. I got gotcha. you. That's good. Yep. You're not too far, man. We're not too far from each other today, which is rare in this world of ours, right? This pick up the six network is sort of man spanned across the country and sometimes across the globe. But as the crow flies today, we sit not, but I don't know, 15 to 20 miles apart. I'm over at apex. What's the difference from apex to where you're at in Wilson, North Carolina. It's not yeah, too it's far. Probably 25 yeah. miles show 30 miles, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Not bad Very at all. Close. Well, listen, man, we're going to talk about life in the Navy and how that, well, I got all the puns today, propelled you <laughs> into your, I don't mean to do it, into your future. And what really has become uh, not just a, a a life in a career in corporate America, but really focusing in on leadership principles. You've written a few, boat, a few books all in the same boat. I have the watch. Uh, also hosting a podcast. So first and foremost, let's get to know you, man. John, where are you from? What, what was life growing up like and what was that path to the Navy? Yeah, so uh, originally from New England, from Manchester, New Hampshire. That's where I grew up, uh, born and raised. And they I created the mudslide in Manchester, New Hampshire, if I'm not mistaken. A mud, the there's mud a slide? there's a restaurant I got. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to jump on you. There's a restaurant <laughs> I used to go to. I visited mud, uh, Manchester a few times with Governor Jim okay. when he was exploring. He was still governor at the time. We kind of knew he was going to run for president. We'd go to all these states and just he'd do all these talks. And I went to a place called something Puritan's Back Room in yeah, Manchester. Yeah, very famous. And yeah, they claim they claim maybe they didn't invent the mudslide. They had like 40 different flavors of it. They claim they invented like the chicken tender, like the breaded chicken yes. tender. Right? Is the, that right? The best, the best chicken tender on earth is the Puritan <laughs> back room in Manchester. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I pulled that one out of nowhere. All right. Anyway, sorry. I just, my brain goes to food, man. I'm hungry. I had, you know, sort of skipped breakfast this morning before. Right, right. A little fast before I mean, lunch. So I'm thinking about. 
Yeah. So, you know, Manchester, New Hampshire is like a blue collar city. Um, yeah. you know, uh, my, my grandparents were born there. My parents were born there. You pretty much, you're born there. You live there, you have your family, you die there. That's, mm. that's pretty much the plan. Right. But fortunately for me, I had two grandfathers that served in World War II. One was, uh, one was in the army, one was in the Navy. And I think just having them in my life, I, I heard their stories and things that they did. And, uh, I just sort of thought of life outside of the city where everybody, you know, it kind of nobody leaves Manchester. Yeah, yeah. And I and I and they did and they did went on these amazing. I mean, obviously, the war was not a, a fun time, but sure, they, they, sure. But they went uh, all over the world, did did some amazing things. And I remember my grandfather's in the Navy. He he was fought in a lot of the battles in the North Atlantic. Uh, he was on a destroyer escort, basically chasing Beautiful. down U-boats, German U-boats. And the stories that he told. And then later, you know, as, as I got older, I read stories about his boat, uh, his ship and what they did. And, and uh, I was just fascinated by uh, by the whole idea of naval warfare and especially uh, submarines. Submarines, for some reason, fascinated me. When I got on the subject of submarines, I started reading about all these heroes in World War II, these submarine commanders that did all these things. I mean, pretty much the submarines held the line after Pearl Harbor, right? So yeah. they were they were they were engaging the Japanese fleet, right? And um, and they held the line until the the, the the fleet could be rebuilt and we could engage, you know, navy to navy. But so I got fascinated with submarines, and as a as a young, I was probably not even in high school yet, and I said I wanted to be on submarines. I wanted to be a submarine officer, and so that's what my goal was. Uh, Try to figure out like how does a kid from New Hampshire get himself on the boats and how do I get, you know, become an officer on a submarine. So, so for me, it was like the, the hearing the stories of my two grandfathers really yeah. helped me imagine what life could be like outside of this, this, the, you know, the blue collar city I grew up in. We probably heard similar stories. My grandfather was on a destroyer, but in the Pacific, right. And so okay. opposite sides of theater, but maybe similar roles. He was a sonar man on the USS Terry, that ship in the water uh, during the Battle of Iwo Jima, right? I mean, wow. from afar, yeah. the flag raises up for that historic moment. They were there for all that. Yeah. And, but, you know, some of my fondest memories, I've, I've told this numerous times on the show, every time we get a chance to talk about it, and I just love it, sitting around that kitchen table with him and, and sharing stories. Mm -hmm. And they weren't often, you know, of the gruesome side of war and a lot of details of that. It was just just stuff they did and the experiences. And, and he was always willing to talk about it. He was a cop too. And man, we just sort of sit at the knee and, and, um, and just relish at the moment to hear about things. And sometimes it was goofy stuff, you know, like yeah. sitting on the deck of the ship, uh, having a movie night, probably in transport, right. Not really in theater yet passing a jug around that they're probably not supposed to be passing around and <laughs> handing it to his superior and thinking he was going to get into ton of trouble and the guy taking a <laughs> twig and, you know, passing along as well. You just, I just remember that stuff and it, it impacts you. And obviously it impacted you in a big way too. I, um, this is good stuff, man. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. I just, I God, I love those memories of being able to do that with him. I do, and and I miss that generation. I miss those yeah. stories. I yeah. miss those. Both those men were such an impact in my life, and uh, and I and I was proud to do what I did. I've proud, to, and, and of all the grandchildren, I was the only one who went in the military. But I just sort of felt like I had to. Like mm -hmm. it was like my my role to kind of pick up the banner and and carry it and do my duty. And uh, it was just a, um, yeah. I mean. When, when, when it's funny because you have a dream as a child, like most kids like dream be a firefighter or a police officer or an astronaut. And usually that stuff fades away. But for me, it never faded. I was just mm. like obsessed with getting in the military and getting into the submarine community and uh, doing, you know, doing that role. And it was, it was by far like a fulfillment of a childhood dream, getting out, getting on the ships and, yeah. and, and serving like I did. So uh, it was, it was awesome. But the challenge is, you know, like, what do you do after you fulfill your, your lifelong dream at 24 years old? You know, that, yeah, that was sure. the challenge. Like, what do I do now? next. You yeah, know, for sure. You know, what for do sure. I, when I got out of the military, I was, I was lost. Like a lot of people, I like, I didn't have a mission anymore. So it was kind of a, it was tough to leave that community. And, uh, but, but the submarine community is difficult because at the time we had very little communication with the outside world. We, we were deployed. We were pretty much under the ocean for three months at a time. We were not communicating with home. So uh, you've got like maybe one message every two weeks or so from, from home, but you couldn't communicate back. So, um, so yeah, it was, it was quite a bit of isolation in that role. And I did seven, I did seven patrols during that time. And so I spent more than two years of my life under the ocean yeah. and it was hard for me to imagine, how am I going to have a family? How am I going to bet have a life outside? So how am I going to so walk around outside? Like it's just a totally different world. 
It what is. John, what time frame was this, right? Cold uh, War he, era, right? When you yeah, guys were yeah. making so, this control. Take take us back into that a little bit in that experience. Yeah. So I first uh, got got to the fleet in 89. And uh and so if you if you know your history, that that was the end of the Cold War. So we were still uh so, so I was there uh from 89 to 94. So when I first started making patrols, uh, the, the Soviet Navy was very active in the Atlantic. So I was on the Atlantic side of it. So uh, ships, submarines, uh, they were all over the place. We would track their you know, kind of whereabouts. So we were trying to avoid them, uh, obviously. But uh, even right outside of Kings Bay, Georgia, the Soviet ships would be right out there waiting for us as we came out of the channel and they would just, you know, put on surveillance on us. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, a young, young boy going through a periscope, you know, young boy, I mean, I was a young man, but looking through a periscope, looking at seeing, you know, a Soviet flag on a ship. I mean, that, that was my life, you know, that's eye opening, right? Yeah. You know, you're like, I'm doing it. I'm, I'm there. I'm doing the thing that I dreamed of doing, you know, and um, but as uh, as you know, you know, the Cold War ended right about, uh, you know, what, 91 or somewhere in there. And uh, and so we started seeing less and less of the Soviet fleet and to the point where it was actually kind of sad by 94. There wasn't even a single I don't think it was a single ship or submarine in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so they had they had fallen so far. Uh, yeah. from where they were in their. Good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Good. Beat it. Yeah. So, um, you know, in a way, I just sort of feel like it was, I was, you know, kind of honored to be part of yeah. that sort of, yeah. you know, the, the last tail end of the the strategic submarines that uh, played a, an important part in that kind of winning yeah. that Cold War battle. Yeah. It's always fun, man. I mean, look, we've talked to a lot of great folks who've done things in the military and different experiences that that submarine one is just, it's super unique, right? Yeah. It's just, Cause it's just, it's such a super unique environment and it, we we can't see a lot of it. I can, I can see, you know, army, uh, you know, uh, you know, cars and like tanks and I can see airplanes and I can even see destroyers and aircraft care submarine thing. Like once you're down in there, once you're down in it, you know, it's hard for maybe some of it, at least for me to kind of envision it. So when you walk on that, you talk about being a young man sort of into that thing and, and, and you're down in the depths and you're talking about like, you don't have a lot of contact. I mean, it, how long does it take? Do you get used to that? Like, is it just, you know, what, what's that experience like? I'm just fascinated I, I, by the idea of being in that thing. Right? Yeah. Human, human nature is interesting. We get, we get used to just about anything you put us in and we figure it out and it sort of becomes normal. Um, but it's not normal. I mean, it's not normal. I remember laying in my rack one night, we were on uh patrol and um, this was on my first patrol and I wasn't in the officer's quarters yet. I was still, I was still kind of a junior officer. They put me in enlisted birthing called a nine man birthing. And there was a missile at my, toe and there was a missile at my head and I was sleeping between two missiles and I was in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, probably 300, 400 feet underneath the ocean. And I thought, well, there's only, there's 24 nuclear missiles in here, a nuclear reactor, and it's run by 19 year olds. And, and here I am, yeah, you know, no when kidding. you really think about it, it kind of freaks you out a little bit. Like, uh, yeah, uh, this is kind of dangerous, you know, uh, like anything could go wrong. <laughs> so, but, um, but you get used to it. It's like, uh, I tell a lot of people, it's like going to work one day and they just lock the doors for three months and you just sort of get used to being in this environment with the same people. Uh, as a leader, I was one of, you know, 15 officers on board and it was a 24 seven business. So you were leading 24 seven. So, you couldn't go home after a you know a hard day and have a beer. You couldn't kick your feet up uh, or I'm going to sleep in on a Saturday because it's, uh, you know, the weekend's finally here. So there was, it, we were on. Yeah, dude, there's no, yeah. you're on stage. No leave time. Yeah, you're on stage. So I would tell my wife, like, you know, I get back from, from uh, you know, deployment. I was like, I just want to hear my first name because I was Mr. Rennie or Lieutenant Rennie oh, for that yeah. time, you know, and you never, you never get outside of that world. So so some people who, who've never experienced that 24 seven kind of thing, it's, it's, a, it's interesting. It becomes your life. You, yeah. you, you build these deep relationships with your, your fellow sailors, uh, the people that work for me, the people I work for, I knew everything uh, about them intimately. You knew, yeah. oh, you, know, you, you knew their favorite food, you knew uh, their birthday, their, you know, their, the names of all their ex-girlfriends. And, you know, <laughs> just you, the, the intimacy is, is hard to describe because you didn't have a lot of space. I mean, it was a, you're in tight quarters. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you know, if you had a conflict with somebody, for example, you couldn't avoid them. You no, had you to got to face out. it. Yeah, you you got to work it out. It. You couldn't hide. And I, you know, and uh, if there was a problem, you had to address it uh, because otherwise you're going to, you know, lead a miserable life. Um, so you had to work things out between, uh, you know, people because you couldn't get rid of somebody, you know, sure. 
in corporate, you know, if someone, you know, you don't like you, you let them go or transfer them to another department. Well, here you got to make the best out of everybody that's working for you, you know? Yeah. No kidding. Have you ever yeah. sat with an astronaut and compared notes? I wonder if the similar, if the, if there's yeah. similar experiences. I, I would imagine um, it, at least like the, the folks that go up and the space station and they stay for long periods of time. I yeah. imagine there's, there's a lot of uh, similarities. In fact, we I've always often thought if you were looking for like people are going on a Mars mission, it's going to be submariners. They, they've sure. Done, they've been locked in a metal tube for, you know, months at a time. They're they're used to it. So it's a it's a it's very similar. Think about it. Everything outside a space station is going to kill you. Right. And everything outside of a submarine is going to kill you, too. Yeah. There's no so, exit. Yeah. So the enemy was obviously the Soviets. Right. But it really was the seawater that wanted to just crush us and send us to the bottom of the ocean. That was the real enemy. Right. And yeah. so we had to kind of keep the, you know, the, the seawater out of the people compartment. That was, you know, kind of our primary mission. Did you this is such a probably stupid question, <laughs> but I mean, did, did you you're not weightless, right? Because it's not the same as going into space. But like, do you feel different? Does your body acclimate differently for that amount so of time? So we, as, as the officer of the deck, so one of the roles I served, I'd be the officer of the deck. I was one of the duty stations I served. So I was in charge of the entire submarine uh, when I had the watch. So it was, it was six hour watches that we stood. And so I was actually in charge of monitoring it in the environment uh, inside. So we're talking about the pressure, the internal pressure, uh, all of the components, oxygen, nitrogen, all that. Mm -hmm. We measured that very carefully. So I, yeah. So no, you, you, you don't feel any different. We try to keep the pressure uh, equal to what atmospheric pressure is so that if okay. we come up and we have to open hatches, there's not going to be a pressure differential. So we try to keep it that way. That being said, a lot of things happen where pressure builds up in the sub. So sometimes we get pressure higher than atmospheric or less. So it does, it does, uh, you know, it's not always steady uh, because we're just a pressure chamber essentially, and we're inside that pressure chamber. But um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's, it, that, that is something that happens. Now, one thing you can feel uh, is that a submarine is essentially uh, as a, as an airplane is to air, a submarine is, is to the sea. So we fly mm -hmm. in, the ocean. So that means we do a thing called angles and dangles. So we take these, uh, we, we will, we'll shoot to the surface. We'll, we'll, we'll dive deep. And so we'll put, you know, anywhere, you know, up to 70 degree angles on, on the boat. And, uh, and so it is like being on a plane, uh, and, yeah. you know, with, and you actually fly it with the helms and employment planes when very similar fly it like a, like a plane. So, yeah. Um, and over a one month, Let's say you're on a one month tour. Do you get any fresh air? I mean, are you, I, I see when you service, right, guys can come up. I mean, did you get any of that experience or you just. Oh, oh. yeah, yeah. So we did. But I mean, there were times when we stayed under, we stayed submerged yeah. the whole time. So I, I did, I think, 110 days submerged once. So um, wow. that's, yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's no sunlight, um, no in our case, it was an all male crew. So no members of the opposite sex and no really good pizza. So, and no, I was going to say, what's the chow like on, <laughs> it can't be great. So one thing is they, they really did a good job with, with food. So uh, I think they realized that, you know, what we were doing was difficult and uh, how do we keep them happy? Well, give them some good food. So uh, we had good chow, but if, if you can probably think of it, I mean, our, our, we'd run out of milk early. We'd run out of fresh veg vegetables and fruits and vegetables early. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of canned stuff. We had a lot of uh, powdered uh, milk. We had a lot of um, anything that could last the duration of the, uh, uh, of the, you know, three months. So we would, you know, towards the end, you get kind of tired. You get this thing called a three bean salad, which would be served mm. at every meal. And it was just like a can of three different beans. And I, even to this day, I can't even look at it because it's, yeah. uh, it was, you know, way too much of that. So incredible. Uh, that blue flag over your shoulder. Don't give up the ship. It's a great one. Yes. Uh, absolutely. Love yeah. it. It's a good Navy man there. All right. So you, you talked about some, you brought it up. I want to, I want to jump right into it. Sort of that conflict component. You, you learned so many different things in that military experience. And I've talked to my friend Jason at pre-veteran and, you know, all these different folks about really being able to leverage that, right. Tap into that incredible, unique skill set. but being in those close quarters, yeah. conflict is likely inevitable, not yeah. likely conflict is inevitable. Oh yeah. And, and, and you have to deal with it in a way that is, is like likely the polar opposite of how traditionally you would incorporate America, which unfortunately too many times is like, pretend like it's not there. So right. was that, was that an initial realization for you, right? Once you transition out of the military, right into sort of, you know, John 2.0 phase. Yeah. 
I got to think, man, that conflict resolution from that time in there has, has served you pretty well over those years. Well, it did. And, and you know, I think what we see it today in, in politics, for example, there's this like your your tribe or my tribe, right? right. It's us, and, us against God, it's them. Terrible, and I, man. It's so and I saw that a lot in uh, in corporate where it was like one division, you know, one factory in a division, you know, competing against another factory in the same division. And I think... Um, I think those skills I learned in the Navy really did help me to say, you know, especially when I was and I ran eight different manufacturing businesses during my time in corporate. And a lot of times the the various manufacturing business heads would, would be battling each other for like, you know, resources, uh, attention from senior management, all these sort of things. And, and they almost felt like they were your your competitors and and a lot of the hmm. a lot of my peers treated it as a competition yeah. whereas I didn't I was like no I don't you know we're in this together like you know I'm a, the second book is called all in the same yeah. boat we're all in the same boat we're in this together you if if I fail you our division fails if you fail our division fails I want to help you be successful and, and I know you want to help me be successful we need each other if we're going to be successful so I think I've always had that idea of trying to find ways that we can all come out uh, in a winning position. And I think um, the other thing is, is that uh, problems, like a lot of people will let, you know, unresolved problems fester. And that's not who I am. So if I have an issue with somebody, I'm going to talk it out. I'm going to say, yeah. look, this is what happened in the meeting. What well, you said this, and, and I didn't really quite appreciate that. You, you know, you made, you made me look bad in front of the boss and, you know, we can't have that. And so other guys might say, well, I'm going to do it to them, right? You're just going to raise the stakes and you're going to have this thing, but no, just the opposite. I want to, I want to, I want to deescalate because we're on the same team. And, and one of the things is, is as a submarine sailor, we recognize that we had to have each other's back, right? Mm. A submarine is maybe one of the more, more unique um, military roles because if something happens, if something goes wrong, we all perish. There is no one guy survives. We all die together. So we live and die together. So we had to have each other's back. And so um, and so I think that kind of mentality has always uh, been a big part of how I've led businesses and how I've interacted with my peers. All right. Tell me uh, about the want, desire, the necessity of writing books. So we've got I Have the Watch and All in the Same Boat. Yeah. What, what spur, right? Did you get to a point where you're like, I got some knowledge. I got, I just I feel like I need to put this on paper. How'd that, <laughs> how'd that uh, happen for you? Well, you know, it's, it's funny how, um, you, you know, most people you think like, like me, I feel like my life has been a normal, boring life. Right. Um, I, I did what I wanted to do as a submarine officer. I went into corporate. I did what I, you know, I, I did a lot of great things, but I think in the last 10 years, I realized that, well, the businesses that I ran always did better than my peers. The, the, the people that I led always said I was their, their favorite boss, I, all this mm-hmm. sort of thing. And I'm like, well, maybe there's something I'm doing differently. So the last 10 years, I sort of thought, you know, thought back on my career. I'm like, wait a second, you know, you know, again, when you're young and in the middle of your career, you're not thinking about writing a book, you're thinking about being, you know, having a successful business. And then, but I think the last 10 years, I'm really reflecting and saying, well, what made my businesses unique? Mm, what made, yeah. what are the, what are the lessons I learned you know, under the ocean that I actually applied to these businesses and actually, you know, created good business results. And, and, you know, it's funny, I, uh, I hired a writing coach to help me out. And uh, it was the first thing he said was, and so all in the same boat was the book I wanted to write. And he said to me, he said, uh, don't write that book. I was like, what do you mean? Don't write that book. I hired you to help me write this book. And he said, he said, (laughs) you have so many other stories, write another book first, learn how to write a book and then write your, the book that you want to write. Oh, okay. And so I have the watch was, uh, um, was his idea, you know, like he said, he said, take some of the ideas, you know, and, and break them down into something that, that are really digestible, um, you know, quick, quick, easy lessons in that book's like got 22 stories, uh, in, in 22 lessons and they're really easy to read. He said, break it down into some, some bite-sized pieces and then get and learn how to write a book first before you write the book that you want to write. Yeah. And at the time I thought, well, you're crazy. I, 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 I can't write two books. I got to write one book, but he was right. I learned so much through that process, right? It's just like, um, anything you do, like the first time you do it, you suck at it. Right. And you have to, you have to, and you have to get out of your comfort zone. You have to do something you've never done before. Yeah. And you're going to learn through that process. And I, I wasn't an author before I wrote that first book. And now I am an author. So when I wrote the book I wanted to write, I was already an author. I'd already had that experience. And so it's pretty good advice then, wasn't it? It was really good advice. Yeah. And in fact, to this day, that first book outsells all my other books. 
So it was the book that was a practice book, and it is the one that resonates the most. It just got translated into Spanish, uh, and uh, it's 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 always sells, uh, mm-hmm. and it's it, it's every you know every day I go on and I see I get sales every day. Yeah. It's a crazy crazy thing, but it was a book that I didn't know I wanted to write, and uh, I wrote the book based on advice. So it was the idea of wanting to share uh, these experiences I had, uh, the lessons I learned from it to help other. Uh, leaders so that they could, you know, maybe how do you, how do you become a a leader worth following without having, you know, to spend two years under the ocean? Yeah. So you wrote, I have the watch followed up with all in the same boat. You also have, you have the watch, which you explain as a guided journey. What does that mean? Yeah. It's a, it's a guided journal for leaders. It's meant to be on your desk. It's it, uh, what it is, it's a, it's like a, you know, almost like if you're a Christian, you have a daily devotion. It's a yeah. daily, it's a daily leadership lesson. Uh, and it's, so there's 50 themes in the book and we take you through 50 themes. Every week's a different theme. And we have you do things and reflect on those things in this uh, guided journal. So every day you have it on your desk, you read a little snippet and it's something to think about uh, as you go throughout your day. And so if you follow all those 50 ideas throughout the entire year, it's uh, it, it's it'll help you be become a better leader. And, and, and so instead of reading a book, you know, one and done, mm-hmm. this is meant to be with you over a year. Yeah. So I mean, write in it, like use it, yeah. <laughs> highlight yeah. stuff. Yeah, exactly. It's meant to be on your desk. It's meant to be messy with dog eared and, and, yeah. and, it, and it's, it's filled with a lot of places for you to write your, your experience in there. So uh, I have the watch was sort of my experience and you have the watch is your experience. What, what do you, how are you, you having the watch, owning the watch? It's very similar to uh, my friend and it's been on the show uh, before Dave Redding, uh, who co-founded uh, this F3 organization, I'm a huge part of right fitness fellowship and faith. He's an army guy, green beret. And uh, Dave uh, wrote was basically a field guide to uh, virtuous leadership and, and mm. it's 50 something points and it's similar. And, and what, what I love about all this is there's not anything really new under the sun as it relates to leadership principles. There are some, there, all right, there are some things that have been there since the beginning. And even if you go back, right, if you're a Bible guy or gal, there's a lot in that great book that explains it as well, but going through the process, right? What, what have you learned? What, right. What, it, where have your eyes been open as it relates to leadership? Cause I know you're just, you, you love it. You consume it. Your Twitter feed is incredible guys. Go <laughs> follow John. His Twitter feed is great for leadership principles and just, just good stuff. You can gobble out, gobble up throughout the day, but where have your eyes been open yeah. in this process? I think the biggest one for me is, um, you know, I got my first manufacturing plant at, at uh, I was 32 years old. So I, I, didn't, I knew nothing about manufacturing. I was, uh, you know, former naval officer, uh, you know, had an engineering degree, but I've never run a production facility before, never was a production manager. And I got my first manufacturing plant. And so in that process, you know, um, so in the beginning, I played like the caricature of the plant manager, like, I don't know what a plant manager is, but I, I think he has to be this person with sure. you know, the corner office and he has to look a certain way, he has to talk a certain way. And I was sort of faking it, you know, and um, and I was trying to have all the answers. Right. I was trying to pretend like I knew what I was talking about and I never had run a manufacturing plant. And I think at some point I realized how much knowledge existed in the four walls of, of the manufacturing plant I was in charge of. And and I realized the decades of experience that I had inside those four walls. And I realized that I really didn't have to have all the answers, but I had to have the right questions and I had to have the ability to, to shut up and listen. And so I had to learn how to put my ego aside and actually engage with the, the experienced people that work, worked around me and really listen to their answers. And then, of course, and then put the rudder in the water and steer the ship where it was right, going to go based right. on that good feedback I had from people. So in my books, I say that leadership is a people business. That's what I learned. I learned that leadership is about people. It's about it's about engaging all of these ideas and experiences and, and backgrounds uh, of all the, the team that's around you and taking the best and brightest and, uh, and, and figuring out the best way to steer the ship to get the maximum results for the organization. So I learned that if we... If we can get people in roles where they're achieving their lifetime dreams, and at the same time, we're achieving company objectives, then everything works. And if you can figure that out, if you make it work, and when you do make it work, it's beautiful. And But it's hard to do. 
uh, and takes a lot of effort. But when you can get get that happening, it's it's really amazing what happens and the results. Everywhere I've gone, uh, record levels of 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 uh, you know sales uh, orders, EBITDA. We we always had success in our, in the business, but it was never me. It was always the people and and the untapped potential in the people. Mm. I sort of tapped into that. Uh, a lot of a lot of leaders hire consultants, and what do the consultants do? They show up and they talk to the people, and then they tell the senior manager, "Well, this is what you should do." Well, the ideas were there all along. Yeah. I just learned how to tap into those ideas and and get to and put them in, in into motion. You know, you can't do all the work in the manufacturing plant, but you have to be in position to make decisions right. about the work, right? And and to guide, to cast vision, right? To enforce a standard, to make hard decisions when you need to. Yeah. So to be able to see, right, see, you know, and talk to people and hear from them and actually listen versus going into that conversation with, I'm just trying to get this out of it. Mm. And to me, it seems like that isn't the way to usually to do it. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. All right. Uh, also, you're sharing these kind of conversations through the Deep Leadership Podcast. So tell us a little bit more about that and, and what kind of conversations you have and who are you talking to there? Yeah. So um, I, it's funny, like three years ago, I realized that people weren't reading long form blog posts yeah. anymore. I've been writing for 10 years and I noticed that people just stopped reading. But I did notice the growth in podcasting. And one of the things about podcasting is you can be doing another thing. Audio content is great because you That's can right. be doing something else while you're listening to this audio yep. content. Driving, so, mowing, running. Driving, mo yep. yeah, working out. So there's a lot of places where you can consume content and be doing something else. And I realized I needed to be in the audio game. So I bought a bought a microphone and started just, okay, sharing my own ideas. And I would book a guest here or there. Uh, and then it just sort of exploded. It, it got bigger nice. than I ever expected it to be. We we crossed into the top 100 U.S. management podcast. Uh, we crossed that threshold. We're a top 2% podcast globally now. Uh, but what we're doing is just meeting with... Uh, uh, we all sorts of type of diff different people, but but the whole the, the the foundation is leadership. So we're talking to practitioners, people that have mm -hmm. started business, led businesses. We're talking to military leaders, people. Uh, I've had a couple of different SEAL team uh, commanders that that nice. are on there. We've had uh, uh, captains of submarines. We've had um, we've had uh, aircraft maintainers. You know, E nines. We've had we've had across the board. Um, we're bringing in anyone who's been been involved with leading leading people. And uh, with from practitioners to authors to academics to uh, to military, and so that's what we have on the show. We do two shows a week, uh, and uh, we we release them on when, uh, Wednesdays and Saturdays. And it's just a conversation with uh, great thinkers. We had Ken Blanchard on the show, one of the greatest oh, leadership uh, yeah. light, writers uh, out there. And it was just wild because I I led businesses, you know, and I you know three decades ago, reading his books, you know, and here, you know, he had him on the show, which is exciting. So Isn't it's, it, it's about, such a great, it's such a yeah. great time for this. And I, you probably feel similar to the way I do just feel so fortunate. And I use yeah. the word blessed because I mean it to be able to meet and engage and have conversations with the kind of folks that you do there. And the ones that we do yeah. here, like a day like today, it's like, this is just what an incredible gift for us to be able to do this or for me to be able to sit with you know, uh, Michael Murphy's dad and, and talk uh, about his yeah, son's legacy, yeah. right. And just all their families done or to have commander Lippold come on and, and recount the moments that the coal is attacked and what they do next and how his ship and his shipmates save their shipmates yeah. from dying and save that ship from sinking in the freaking port of Aden, Yemen. Like just to be able to hear from people that have those kinds of experiences. And then what has been really neat for us is just and then also find the folks you would have never heard of yes, right? that yeah, you would have never yeah. known about. We interviewed yeah. a couple from Burgaw, North Carolina, not too far from you and I, who the husband saved his wife from a rabid bobcat attack. I'm like, well, that's picking up the six if I've ever heard of it. And they're just regular <laughs> yes. folks, man. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. pretty awesome. It's just fun to be able to do it. I know you just love doing it too. Absolutely. I just had a guest on last night telling the story of he was, uh, he, his son was in a scout troop and, uh, the the scout master and his entire family were murdered by their oldest son. Oh my and god! So, so there were three in the family that were in the scout troop, and the scout master were all killed. And this was in Baltimore uh, about ten years ago. Or so, and um, and he took up the mantle and became the scout leader for these twenty young young wow. uh, young in a, men. Such a traumatic time after oh after the loss of their beloved scout master and and uh, and three of their good friends, you know, and, and he, he took up the mantle and just hearing that story and how he led mm -hmm. those young men 
like you said, uh, not someone that's famous, not someone that you're going to see trending on Twitter, but the, yeah. the kind of the, it was pure leadership, what he did and how he led those young boys and and uh, and 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 the lessons he learned about himself through that process, which I was bet. really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, shout out to my man, Wortham. If he's listening, if you've made it this far in the episode for making the connection, he sent me an email and you were talking about the podcast, right? Reaching the heights that it did. And he said, you guys are destined <laughs> to get together and have a conversation. And I've absolutely felt that way this entire time. John, before we go, tell folks where they can find you, right? I want them to buy books, listen to podcasts, support everything you're doing. So give us a, a data dump, my friend. Yeah, it's everything's at johnsrenny.com. Links to uh, social media, links to my podcast, links, links to the book. Everything is there, johnsrenny.com, one-stop shopping. And if you spell John any way you spell it, it'll get there. It'll get there with an H or without. <laughs> Doesn't matter. That's good. He's John Rennie. The books are I Have the Watch and All in the Same Boat. The podcast is the Deep Leadership Podcast. And John's been an absolute thrill today. Yeah, it's been great. Thanks for having me on. Anytime. He's John Rennie. I'm Brian Jodis. That's been this episode of Pick Up The Six Podcast.